Continuing on in the 13th chapter of Revelation, we're ready for verse 11, chapter 13 and verse 11. This is the chapter that has introduced us to the two beasts, the beast of the sea and the beast of the land. Remember, in the second half of the book of Revelation, which begins with chapter 12, we have many instances in which Satan is mimicking God. And one of the mimicries is that Satan pretends to be the counterpart of God, and the beast and the false prophet make up his trinity. Just as there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, so there's Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. And I call the second beast the false prophet because after we finish reading and studying this chapter, in the rest of the, chap uh, rest of the chapters that remain in our study of Revelation, this second beast is going to be identified as the false prophet. Last week when we talked about the first beast, we recognize that that is a representation symbolically of the world powers. The uh, second beast is a representation of false prophecy. Now, false prophecy and pagan world powers serve Satan's purpose. This is the enemy that we face. And each of these uses their primary weapon, the untruth, the lie. The main battle that's being described all the way through the book of Revelation is a battle between God and Satan. The battle takes place in your life and in mine. Truth is the weapon that God uses. The lie is the weapon that Satan uses. If we believe the truth, accept the truth, and live the truth, we will be on the victory team. If we believe the devil's lie, we reject the truth of God, we will go down in defeat. Now let's look at the actual verses then that describe this second beast. In verse 11, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. Question number one, who is represented as a beast coming up out of the earth? As I've indicated to you, this beast represents false prophecy. In other words, these are people that pretend to be religious, but they're not speaking the truth. They're not speaking what God's word wants us to know. So the first beast is political, the second beast is religious. And God uses both that which is political and that which is religious. Uh, Satan uses that rather to accomplish his purpose in trying to defeat God. Question number two, how does the appearance differ from reality with this beast? Notice that he appears to be very nice. But when he opens his mouth, you realize he's not what he appears to be. So when you see the two horns like a lamb, remember the symbolism of horns speaks of power. The lamb is representation of Christ, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the false prophet intends to make you believe that he has great power because he's representing the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, he's misrepresenting the Lord Jesus Christ. So, though he gives the appearance of being a person of God, he in reality is not. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15 in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Remember, deception is the tool of the devil. Verses 12 and 13. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. He makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs, so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. Now, if you're familiar, and most of you are, with the Old Testament scriptures, you know fire coming down out of heaven is what the prophets of Baal tried to make happen, and they couldn't do it. Elijah, the prophet of God, was able to do it. But here... The false prophets are trying to mimic God, are performing miracles just as God performs miracles. They are not able to do so in the same sense of the term as the word miracle is used in Scripture. More about that in a moment. Look at question number one. In what way do the two beasts work together? Both of them have behind them the authority of uh, Satan. 
uh, who gives his authority to politics, to the political government, and he gives his authority to the second beast, which is the false prophet. In other words, they're all three working together. They're all accomplishing the same purpose. They're all depending upon you believing something that's not true. Whereas God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are constantly urging us to accept what is true. Because the truth will set us free. Number two, what is the meaning of whose fatal wound was healed? I think this indicates that uh, there are different times throughout history that it appears as if uh, terrible rulers <coughs> have come, but then they've gone. But it's not long until somebody else rises up again. And I think that this is a mimicry of Christ's resurrection from the dead. Uh, many of you will remember the days of Stalin. You remember the days of Hitler. <coughs> and you think, okay, it's all over with. No, it isn't all over with. And though these were two tyrants in the past, there are others who are taking his place even in our day. And when they pass away, if God delays the time and allows it to happen, when they subside, there'll be somebody else to take their place. That's what he's talking about here. They appear to have been dead, but they are raised again. Now, what number three, what makes the second beast attractive to men? The thing that makes him attractive to men is because he's able to do something that you can't explain and you automatically assume, wow, isn't that an impressive miracle? I want to read you something from Matthew chapter 24. And this is actually verse 24. Mm -hmm. This is Jesus talking about uh, when the temple in Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And the disciples who have heard him say this are saying, when's this going to happen? And so Jesus gives them signs that actually all took place prior to August in the year 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman power under the leadership of Titus. Now, in giving these signs, he said there are going to be uh, wars, rumors of wars. There are going to be famines. There are going to be earthquakes. There are going to be er false prophets. Listen to what he says in verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Now, what's he saying? He's saying that these false prophets are going to do the same thing he's doing. The only difference is they are fakery. What Jesus does is reality. All you need to do is just simply understand man's ability, uh, particularly those who are uh, excellent in the field of magic or those who are great illusionists and uh, how they can make something appear so real when in reality it's not real at all. And that's the thing that we have to keep reminding ourselves of it's so interesting to me that uh, many false prophets try to prove to you how they're able to do such wonderful things. And uh, every now and then, somebody will come up and uh, say, all right, I'm going to challenge you on that. And every time that they're challenged, they have to back down and admit, yeah, we just fooled the people. We tricked them. And in our modern technology, with all the electronics and everything else they have going for them, it's a pretty easy thing to do been a long time ago now when I was in graduate school in Indianapolis, Indiana. But while I was there, I went to uh, the Indiana State Fair. And uh, I just looked at everything that was there at the State Fair, just walked around. And I didn't grow up on a farm, but I found it quite interesting. I went into a big dairy barn, and there was Elsie, the cow. Remember <laughs> Elsie? I stood there and looked at Elsie, and directly Elsie said, what do you stand looking here at me for? <laughs> I looked over here, I looked over there, I was the only one standing there, and that cow was talking to me. <laughs> and that cow said, no, don't look around, I'm talking to you. You in the green shirt, you know, or green tie, or whatever I was wearing. Well, that's kind of scary. <laughs> I'm not used to talking to cows. <laughs> Okay, you get my point. Obviously, there's some trickery going on. Somebody hiding someplace was able to see me in some kind of a way and was able to project their voice over some kind of an electronic system 
to make it sound like that cow's talking to me. <laughs> Any of you have ever been to Knott's Berry Farm in California? Uh, they have something very similar there. I remember as a young, young person, uh, our parents were with us and we uh, visited the old jailhouse. Now, we didn't go in. We just looked in and saw the prisoner. And uh, directly the prisoner said uh, to my mother, whose name is Helen, said, Helen, why are you staring at me? <laughs> and the lips of that fellow in there were going. And she was shocked. <laughs> my dad just stand back having a great fun because he had known about this in advance and gone over and paid the fellow a certain amount of money. He said, I'm going to give you a dollar bill and you'll talk to my wife and uh, she'll, she'll talk about this the rest of her life. Now, this is what false prophets do. And they're able to do that. And that's what Jesus wants to make it very clear. He said, uh, I want you to realize that when they do their wonders, you're going to be convinced that this is for real. It's not. But they're going to fool a lot of people <coughs> into thinking that. So we need to be concerned about one of the, you know, one of the main things that I've observed is all the fakery that's involved in so-called faith healing. A number of years ago in Springfield, Illinois, uh, they were going to have a faith healing service. And it had been advertised pretty big. And so some of the medical doctors, Christian doctors in Springfield, got together and said, uh, let's challenge them. And so they did. They said, uh, we understand you're going to have a faith healing service. And if this thing really works, we're in the medical profession. We really want to know this. Uh, what we'd like to do, though, if, with your permission, is we'd like to examine all these people before they come to you, and then after you've healed them, we'd like to examine them again. The interesting thing was, that meeting was called off. <laughs> I wonder why. <clears throat> but I don't know who I'm talking about here, but there are a lot of people in this world that are pretty gullible, and they believe almost anything. And, uh, you know, we're constantly being deceived by what we hear. Voices that we think we hear are really not the, what we're hearing. What we think we're seeing is really not what our eyes is telling us. So I just want us to know the Bible makes it very clear that uh, uh, Jesus said this, this is going to happen. And so we should not be deceived by it. We should be prepared for it. Verse 14. And he deceived those who dwell on the earth because of the signs in which was given in to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell in the earth to make an image to the beast who had the, sword, who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. Now, what is the image of the beast? Uh, it's, it's some form of idolatry. Now, idolatry is simply anything that stands between you and God. This could be a statue. It could be a puppet. It could be a painting. It could be any number of things that... Uh, are used in order to deceive other people. And it is a fact that, uh, and I've seen it, and perhaps some of you have, I've actually seen people bow down before a religious statue. I've seen, uh, I visited the Vatican years ago, and I saw a father take his little young son up to the statue of St. Peter and said, now I want you to be sure and kiss his big toe. That's the kind of thing we're talking about here. Uh, this is not, this violates the first three of the Ten Commandments. All three were violated. And yet uh, that goes on in our world today. Verse 15. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He caused them all, the small, the great, the rich, the poor, the free, and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, and he prov provides that uh, no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Question number one. What new feature of the image of the beast is given in verse 15? Well, in this particular case, this image is able to uh, breathe, speak, and kill those who didn't worship him. Uh, I, don't, I don't like to talk about this, 
but I, I hope that enough of you have remembered things that you've heard in the mail, uh, in the news rather, of people thinking they see the image of Christ on the glass of a big building in Tampa, Florida a few years ago, and uh, pictures of uh, the Virgin Mary and tears are coming from the eyes of that picture. This is the kind of thing that's being talked about here. And the thing that is really tragic to me is how many people are gullible enough to accept all that. And it's a case of where in many instances, they're just letting their minds wander away and, and they're allowing themselves to be deceived and they're believing things that they want to believe, but which there's actually no real basis for that belief, except the fact that they are just, have a wild imagination and they're believing some of the things that are told to them. Now number two, why is worship of the beast wrong? Well, it's wrong for the reasons I've already indicated. This violates God's clear law. We should have no other gods before us. There's only one God. And we should not make any graven images. How can you make an image of something that doesn't even exist as far as material things are concerned? God is spirit. You don't touch spirit. You don't see spirit. You don't hear spirit. You don't smell spirit. You don't taste spirit. And yet people are using these very images, these statues, these paintings, or whatever it may be, to uh, be their God for them. It's really tragic. It's wrong because God says it's wrong. Number three, what is the mark on the right hand or on their forehead? The mark simply indicates that these people who are involved in accepting false prophets are those who are clearly identified in that identity. Now, what you need to understand is that you and I are clearly identified as God's people too. And we've already saw this back in chapter 7. And in chapter 7, the mark was upon the forehead. And uh, I indicated to you then that uh, this mark on the forehead is significant because it's right up there where it can be clearly seen. Now, what do people clearly see? Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Can you tell when people love each other or they hate each other? Sure you can. That's one of our identities. Another time Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. So I can go out in the orchard and I can know whether it's a grapefruit tree or an orange tree by the fruit. I may not be able to tell it if there's no fruit in the tree, but once that fruit's on there, I sure know the difference between a an orange and a grapefruit, not only in size, but especially in taste. Now, this is the way in which we are identified. Now, is Satan identified the same way? Yes, he is. And you don't have to be around a person's on Satan's side too long until suddenly you can observe their vocabulary and think, that doesn't sound like a Christian talking to me. And then you can find out how they, how they rehearse to you some of the things they do and some of the things they like to do, and I think, Oh, wait a minute. God wouldn't approve of that. What are they doing? They're indicating to me their true identity. And we all do this, whether we like it or not. If you're a Christian, I mean, if you're really a dedicated Christian, other people are going to know it if they're around you any time at all. And if you're not a Christian, people are going to know it. Now, you need to understand that many people who are not Christians do live a very good moral life. Don't be fooled by that. One of the times in my past, I really got into big trouble. And I, I feel badly about it, and yet it turned out okay. I was preaching a sermon one Sunday morning, and I said to the audience, I said, I, I just don't believe that uh, our biggest problem in this town are the drunks. I said, I know we've got some drunks. And I said, I don't really believe that the biggest problem in our town are the prostitutes. I said, now this is my opinion, but I think that the biggest problem we have in our town are the good moral people that don't have any time for God. There was a man attending services that morning that was not a Christian. That was a fine moral man. I found out about it. He was offended by what I said. I knew I had to go see him, so I did. 
I wanted to make sure that uh, he understood what I was saying. When I went to see him, I didn't even bring up the subject. I just wanted to visit with him, and we did. But it was some time afterwards that I saw him again. And then we broached the subject. And I said, I understand, somebody told me this, that you're offended by what I said. He said, well, I sure was. I said, I want to explain this to you. I don't think that our teenage boys in this community are going to be offended by you at all. In fact, I think they're going to be attracted to you. Because I can't think of many men in our community that are finer men than you are. I said, that's, that's part of the story. The other part of the story is, I can't name one teenage boy in our community that would go up to a drunk and say, well, I sure hope I can be like you. And I don't know one girl in our community would go up to a prostitute and say, I sure hope sure I can get in the trade that you're in. I said, I really have high hopes for our young people. But I said, who's going to really lead them astray? How can a person be such a good person like you are and not be a Christian? I said, I acknowledge you're a good moral man, but who's getting credit for your life? Not the Lord, because you've rejected him. He said, well, I never thought about that way. Later on, I baptized him. <laughs> And when I got ready to leave that ministry after eight years preaching in that church, that man and his wife tried harder than anybody else to keep me from moving. Mm -hmm. We need to confront people with the truth, but I think sometimes we have misunderstood what it means to be on the Lord's side or not be on the Lord's side. And there are a lot of really fine moral people that are not living their lives to the glory of God. They've rejected him. They've not submitted to his will. They've not taken upon themselves the name Christian. They've not accepted his forgiveness through obedience to the gospel. So uh, people are identified. So I just want us to understand in this particular uh, question number three that uh, the devil is identified uh, sometimes very cleverly, but when you really get to know uh, who the false prophets are, you can see how they are very deceptive in leading people astray. By the way, when you think of these false prophets we're talking about, remember the scripture that says the devil makes an appearance as an angel of light? Then, now don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. I'm kind of bold, sometimes too bold. I just spill it out. <coughs> I know it's dangerous to do. But has it ever occurred to you that you may perish the thought. But has it ever occurred to you that somewhere in the past the devil was sitting beside you in the pew in church on Sunday morning? <laughs> now don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But there are a lot of people that want to give you the appearance, man, I'm a fine Christian man. They're not a fine Christian man at all. They're a good moral man. But they, don't, they haven't obeyed the gospel. They haven't accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. There they are. Are they sent there by the devil? Well, I'll let somebody else answer that question. I just want us to know that uh, one of the most subtle ways for the devil to accomplish his purpose is to come into the church and stir up trouble. <clears throat> If there's any body of believers that ought to never have trouble among themselves, it's those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the worst things that can happen to a church, I think, is a church to live. And why people get angry at each other, and they get mad at each other, and speak to each other, and then it becomes a big sore, and it spreads, and does a lot of damage. Then we need to back away and say, wait a minute. What is my identity saying to other people? Who am I really? Am I a Christian or am I not? Need to, these passages of scripture ought to really challenge us to make sure that our relationship with the Lord is genuine. We're not playing a game of pretend. The final verse in this chapter, <coughs> verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for the number is that of a man, 
and his number is 666. Now, the number 666 is just simply a triplicate of the number that speaks of that which is without God. Remember, the sacred number, God's number, is seven. Number six falls short of it. Six days, everything was created. Seventh day was God's day. But this leaves God out of the life, leaves God out of the picture completely. And he just simply is emphasizing our trinity, 666, Satan, the beast, and the false prophet, we are who we are. And they're trying to deceive the rest of the world by who they claim to be. Yes, they have an identity. Now, I should make a further comment about a previous verse. I kind of skipped over it. I didn't mean to do that. When it talks about in verse 17, he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Let me uh, just raise a, a fictitious story. Supposing that the satanic false prophets and false political powers uh, gain the kind of control that... Uh, they're able to enact laws which would say uh, you cannot sell any merchandise nor can you buy any merchandise unless you have this certain mark. Uh, let's just say that everyone has to have uh, a bracelet and the bracelet has something on it that identifies them with this one particular mark. So you go to the grocery store and say, I want to buy these groceries. And if you pick up the groceries, put them in your cart, come to the checkout counter, and the first thing that the person at the checkout counter says, says, let me see your bracelet. I don't have a bracelet. Well, you can't buy those groceries. Well, I've got to have this food. I, I don't care. You can't have those. Well, okay, I'll do my business someplace else. But everywhere you go, you get the same kind of response. Or supposing you want to set up business. And somebody comes into your business and said, by the way, I want to buy uh, that piece of furniture I saw you advertise. Uh, they said, okay, uh, uh, I'll sell it to you. And I said, well, so I don't get any trouble, let me see your bracelet. Well, I don't have one. Well, I can't buy that. I'll get in trouble if I buy from you because you don't have that mark. Now, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I think that's a challenge that we face here. Where do we stand? Whose side are we on? And how loyal are we to our Lord? And when all the pressures are brought to bear, don't you fear, there will be pressures. This is not me speaking. Jesus said, if you follow me, they're going to treat you the same way they treated me. Peter said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that's going to come upon you. It's not going to be easy to live a Christian life. And it may get real tough. I think we've had it pretty easy in our country. Amen. And I'm certainly thankful for the freedom we enjoy. But I'm not blind to the fact that it could very easily be taken away from us. And I only hope and pray that if that day should ever come close to home for any one of us, we'll have the strength to die if need be, rather than recant our faith. Now, history is full of stories of Christians who recanted their faith. In fact, in the early church history, one of the problems that the church had was the fact that during the times when it was so rough, the people who were Christians said, oh no, I'm not a Christian. And the only reason they said that is because they wanted to live. But then after the danger passed by and things began to level off again, they wanted to come back in the church. Well, are you going to let them back in or not? Some of them said, no. Anyone that's a coward like you all cowards are going to be in hell. That's what the Bible teaches. We'll get to that when we get to the end of the book of Revelation. We're not going to let you in the church. Other people say, wait a minute. They're repenting. Oh, are they? Or are they just pretending to be? And they couldn't quite decide. It split the church. Some people received them back in, accepted their repentance as genuine, and thought they really were sorry. Maybe they were. Who knows? But it split the church. Well, did the devil get his purpose accomplished? Yeah. Not only during the time that they quit, but then the time when they tried to come back. Uh, 
I'm just simply wanting to underscore the fact that uh, we face uh, a foe that is very uh, clever, very powerful, very persuasive, and extremely deceptive. Now, chapter uh, 14, I call Blessed Assurance. This has, in some people's minds, is in reality the greatest chapter in the whole book. And they may be right. Uh, we're going to discuss this in uh, seven different divisions as we look at this particular chapter. Uh, these seven different uh, paragraphs or divisions will underscore uh, wonderful promises and uh, important warnings. But in every way, what we're going to read in chapter 14 is going to be a real delight after having spent all this time in chapter 13. Because this is the very opposite. Is there a bright side to this whole picture? Yes, there is. And we have the privilege to be in that picture. So let's look at the first five verses first to see. And these five verses, what he's going to indicate is that the redeemed, that is the church, that is Christians, are in communion with God and our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, how do you identify those who are on the winning team? By the relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I add through the Lord Jesus Christ because it's through Christ and his shed blood that we can come into the presence of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He died, he shed our blood for the washing away of our sins. And it's our receiving that benefit of what he's accomplished for us. We could never have done it for ourselves. Folks, I don't care how good you live. There's not a person alive that can live a good enough life to get to heaven. Just cannot do it. There's not a one of us that can be righteous enough or good enough. Now, don't get me wrong. We ought to be as good and righteous as we can. But never forget, the Bible describes our righteousness as filthy rags. Do you know why we're saved? We are saved only for one reason. And that is because we were offered a gift and we accepted that gift. And that gift was salvation. You can't save yourself. Neither can I. None of us can take away our sins. Christ did. He's the only one that could. And he said, now, I've done this for you. I want to give this forgiveness to you. Will you receive it? <clears throat> it's a gift. You don't do anything to earn it. You don't do anything to deserve it. It's a gift. And he's describing those of us who have received the free gift of God, which is a gift of salvation, forgiveness, promise of eternal life in heaven. Let's then uh, look at these first five verses. Then I looked and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion. Now the capital L on Lamb should remind you that this is a clear representation or symbolism of the Lord Jesus Christ. Standing on Mount Zion and with him was 144,000 having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of a loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They have been purchased from among men as firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. Wow. What a, what a paragraph. Number one, in contrast with the last verse of chapter 13, what does John now see? He now sees the Lamb that is standing on Mount Zion, and with him are the 144,000. What a contrasting picture. Now, as I've indicated, the Lamb is Jesus Christ. Mount Zion is the designation for Jerusalem, the holy city. Now, the 144,000 are God's people. These are God's people now that are, are living here upon the earth. Now, how do we know who they are? Well, they're clearly identified by the mark on their forehead. Now, as I've already told you earlier tonight, 
the mark on the forehead is simply indicating this is conspicuous. Love is conspicuous. Through all my years of teaching in a Bible college, I've had an occasion to see many college students begin to fall in love. So I'd be walking down the hallway one day and I would say hi to a fellow that I've always spoken to. He's always spoken to me. I'd say, hi, Bob. He didn't answer me at all. I thought, that's strange. And I turned around and looked. <laughs> He's holding hands with a sweet little girl. <laughs> He's falling in love. You know what? Love makes you deaf. <laughs> it does. It does. It also makes some people blind. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell me the love is something that you can't discern. Oh, yeah, you can. If you love the Lord, folks, listen. Other people are going to know it. You can't hide it. Now, if you think you've hidden it, chances are you've deceived yourself. You don't really love the Lord. If I should suddenly show up one Wednesday night and my wife's not with me and uh, you'd come up to me and say, what's wrong with her? I said, well, I don't know. You'd probably think, I don't think I better touch that one. <laughs> but then the next week, she didn't show up again. Where is she? I don't know. Well, now what are you being questioned? My relationship with my wife. You have good reason to. Nonchalant, don't know where she is, don't care. What are you bothering me about this for? You're never going to hear that kind of answer from me. I promise you that. I love my wife. And I want the world to know it. I love my Lord, and I want the world to know that too. So our, our identity is very clear. It needs to be understood that way. Now, this uh, is presenting a real contrast here then uh, by indicating that Mount Zion is the designation for Jerusalem and 144,000 are God's people. We talked about that in the first half of the seventh chapter of Revelation. The first eight verses describe that. This is, again, a symbolic number. It's just simply the number 12 is the signature of God's people. 12 times 12 gives you 144,000. Why 12 times 12? Well, probably 12 representing the 12 uh, patriarchs of the Old Testament, the 12 apostles of the New Testament. In other words, the people who live under the Old Dispensation, the people who live under the New Covenant. All of them are God's people. All of them had their blood, uh, had the blood of Christ cleanse them from their sins. Before that time in the Old Testament, they were offering sacrifices in anticipation of the supreme sacrifice when Jesus died. Since that time, we observe the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day to remind us of the blood that was shed in the past that is continuing to flow and wash away our sins. And we receive that initial cleansing in the waters of baptism when we died with Christ, buried, and rose to walk in newness of life. Only have a new life by the sin question being taken care of. Question number two. Does the Lamb stand alone on Mount Zion? Well, no, he doesn't. He's there with 144,000. I want to read you something here in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the saints of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better of the blood than the blood of Abel. So. Mount Zion, as indicated by the Hebrew writer, is a present reality as also uh, a picture of heaven itself. So all people here that are on God's side are presented together and uh, we're standing there with the Lamb, not, uh, not sitting down, we're standing. Uh, by the way, the land, Lamb is standing on a mountain. It's not like the bee standing on the sand of the shore. Does that kind of remind you of the way Jesus concluded the Sermon on the Mount? Mm -hmm. Two men built houses, one on the sand, the other on the rock. I like that hymn. On Christ the solid rock I stand, 
all other ground is sinking sand. We stand firm, standing on a mountain, nothing to be ashamed of, nothing is going to sink from underneath us. Now what, are, what names are written on their foreheads? Well, this is the name of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, I think that this uh, again goes back to chapter 7 and verse 3. And there was a seal that was placed up here. And we studied then and note that the seal stands for ownership and safety and security and identity. And all of that is ours in Christ. Number four, how is the voice of heaven described? I like this. Like, a, like many waters. I think that's impressive. But he says, like the sound of loud thunder. Now that's going to get my attention right away. And then, like the sound of harpers playing on their harps. And that's me. So what's the sound like? Well, it has great volume. And it's, it's the kind of a sound that it gets you. You, have, you. you stop and listen to it. It's got your attention. And as you listen, it's so beautiful. So meaningful. Wow. Now, before whom was a new song sung? Well, before the throne, that is before God, uh, we're singing. And all nature, the four living creatures represent nature. They're joining in and singing these praise to God. Now, who was able to learn this new song? Well, notice he says, no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth of all of God's people. Now, I think the best way I can describe this to you is that, uh, do you remember when the children of Israel were led by Moses out of Egypt? They came to the Red Sea. What happened there? The waters parted, didn't they? They crossed on dry land to the other side, and the Egyptian army followed behind them. But when the Egyptian army got into the bed of the dry bed of the Red Sea, what happened to them? Water swallowed them up. Now, the children of Israel now are already safe on the other side. They're on the way to the promised land. They're looking back and seeing what happened to the Egyptian army. What do they do at that time? They sing. What's it called? The Song of Moses. Let me give you another story. Who's the name of the only woman that served as a judge of Israel? Deborah. Deborah. She was living at a time when... Uh, the foe was uh, a group of Canaanites <coughs> under the leadership of Jabin, their king and Sisera, their captain in the army. And they met together in the valley of Esdralon. And uh, Deborah knew this was going to happen. There's going to be a showdown. So she called Barak to uh, be the leader. And Barak said, well, I'll only do this if you go with me. She said, okay, I'll go with you. So they gather, uh, what is it, 10,000 of the Israelites up on top of the mountain, and they look down in the valley, and what do they see? What do the Canaanites have that the Israelites don't have? 400 iron chariots. I mean, they are equipped. They're ready. What do the Israelites have? Hope. God. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hope. Now, you know, just stop and think about that. I'm going to fight. I don't have anything to fight with. And you, boy, you've got everything you need. So they come down that mountain, and they, huh, no problem at all. I mean, these, these people that were in the iron chariots jump out of those iron chariots and run away as fast as they can. Now, why'd they jump out of the iron chariots? It rained, and it rained, and it rained. What does that do to the mud? It makes it so deep those iron chariots are more of a problem than they are a benefit. Who do you think caused all that? God's the one that operates that spigot. He turned it on full force. Did they have a victory? Yes, they did. And what did they do? They sang. Now what I just narrated to you in my own feeble way is in the fourth chapter of Judges, read chapter 5. That's a song. What's this all about? Victory. Whose victory? God's victory. <clears throat> and it's God who's going to give us the victory too. So when I think here about the, the song that's being sung here, I'm reminded of the song of Moses. God gave them the victory in crossing the Red Sea. Song of Deborah. God gave them the victory over the Canaanites. Number seven. 
How are those who sing the new song described in verse 4? Notice, they have not been defiled with women. That just simply is a symbolic way of saying these people are pure. They're honest. They're upright. They're faithful. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. What does that mean? Walking in the steps of Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. He's our example that we're to follow. Number eight, what very important characteristic of the 144,000 is noted in verse 5? Notice, this is important, folks. No lie was found in their mouth. What does that mean? That means that whatever was in their mouth was true. That's God's weapon. No lie. Totally honest integrity. And they are blameless. Now how can they be blameless? How can you and I be blameless? Only one way. <coughs> I'm not blameless. Oh yes I am. I am because the blood of Christ has washed away all my sins. And when every sin is gone, which only the blood of Christ can accomplish, that leaves me without anything for you to use to blame against me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a joy to share with these wonderful people gathered tonight in the study of your word. And how beautiful it is to read words like we've just read in these first five verses. Symbolism that helps us to realize how sweet the music is that comes from heaven above. How wonderful the truth is that defeats the lie. How magnificent and great is your power that overcomes the enemy. May we remain faithful and true to you every step of the way of life as long as we live and breathe until we either die or you come. Encourage us, empower us, and lead us to that end. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.